Well, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to In the Word. Where did the month of August go? It seems like uh, this year has flown by, um, and we're into the month of September, so good for you. We'll be um, in the Old Testament. I know some of you are looking forward to getting into more familiar territory. So by the end of the month, we'll be in the book of Matthew. We start, according to my schedule here, September 24th, we'll be in the book of Matthew. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, but as we go through the Old Testament, you're laying a, a, just a great foundation for the um, deeper and richer and more profound understanding of the New Testament. And to um, uh, move you along, I think in your sanctification, we're all of us in that period of time between our salvation and our glorification. And uh, the Lord is working in us and using his word um, as, as well as prayer and fellowship to uh, shape us and form us into the image of his son. So take heart in that as you go through the uh, Old Testament. Today we'll be looking at Ezekiel chapters 21 and 22. Just wanted to point out again, you know, we're in this section of the book where we're talking from chapters 20 to 24 about the righteousness of God's judgment. So today and tomorrow, we'll be looking at several sections, um, several chapters. And I just wanted to give you an outline. And then down below uh, this video, I'm going to put an outline for you to uh, reference. So you can uh, see where you're at in the book. I think it helps orient us in our reading. But uh, last uh, yesterday, we looked at a series of messages uh, about the uh, reasons for or the righteousness of God's judgment. Uh, today we're going to see some parables. So we'll see four parables of the sword in chapter 21. Then we'll see uh, a furnace of judgment in chapter 22. We'll see in chapter 23 a, a parable about two sisters. And then tw chapter 24, a parable uh, around a boiling pot. And then finally, uh, this section ends also in chapter 24 with a sign. This time it's the tragic death of Ezekiel's wife. So through these signs and parables and messages, God is defending the righteousness of his judgment against Israel as we go through here. So let's look at chapter 21. Uh, very interesting here. Uh, parable of the sword. Uh, the sword is mentioned 15 times. There's essentially four parables here. I wanted to remind you, if you go back to the introduction of Ezekiel, we're in a section that was written in August of 591. So this is about five years before um, the destruction of Jerusalem. God is warning them. So in the first parable, uh, in the, which is in the first uh, seven verses of chapter 21, it's a parable of a sword, and in this case, the sword is drawn. Sword, sword is drawn from its sheath, and it's ready to go. One of the things you'll probably notice in your reading is in verse 3, where it says that the Lord will cut off both the righteous and the wicked. Well, back in chapter 18, uh, Ezekiel told us prophetically that God was going to uh, judge each man according to his works, according to his relationship with the law, and each person will be held accountable. So to hear that both the righteous and the wicked will both be taken is a little disturbing. In fact, the uh, translators of the, uh, the original translators of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, which we call the Septuagint, actually changed uh, the um, wording here so that the Septuagint reads both the unrighteous and the wicked. I think what's happening here when he says cut off, sometimes cut off means death. Other times cut off means uh, separated, in this case separated from the land. And I think that's a better way to understand this is that they're not going to both die. In fact, they some will. Some of the righteous will die uh, just as um, the good and the bad uh, died together in God's judgment, um, but they will all be cut off from the land. They'll all be sent into exile. Verse 6, we see one of the many times that Ezekiel not only gives a prophecy, 
but then acts out the um, reaction to that prophecy as a sign to those around him. So he's got not only words, but also his actions. Let's not forget as well that at the end of verse 20, he had a parable of a forest fire that this fire was going to rage through Judah and Jerusalem in destruction, people laughed him off. They said, uh, um, all the flesh will see that uh, I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall be not be quenched. Our oh, Lord, they are saying of me, is he not a maker of parables? So God's reacting to that by sending more parables with a dire message. The... Um, Verse 8 then begins a section that goes down to uh, verse 17 about the sword being prepared and sharpened. Uh, seems to go back and forth between um, discussion about the sword and then a discussion about the rod. Sometimes a rod is used as a ruler's scepter. So when it says, you have despised the rod, my son, with everything of wood, uh, it may be referring to rejecting God's rule. I think more likely, though, it's talking about God's chastisement, that they've rejected God's chastisement. And again, if we go back to Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, to get some insight, and he's quoting the Old Testament in those verses, that God brings chastisement, and it goes from a mild reproof to a scourging. And God has here given them uh, time after time uh, reproof and punishment, and they fail to heed it. Um, so he is going to bring a severe scourging among them. And I think that's a great lesson for you and I, brothers and sisters, that we need to pay attention. And when God gives us a reproof, we need to heed it. Otherwise, he is going to turn up the heat on us. He is going to intensify his correction until we get the message. Verse 18 then begins with uh, the sword directed to Jerusalem. This is a very interesting section from verses 18 down to um, 27 because it gives us in detail what um, uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar is going to do as he comes to Jerusalem. So here the sword is directed to Jerusalem in the opening verses then. And then... Uh, some of the historical background, it says, Mark a way for the sword to come to Rabbah of the Ammonites and to Judah and to Jerusalem, the fortified. So at this time, there were basically three cities or countries that were in rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, Tyre, uh, Jerusalem, and, uh, and uh, southern Judah, uh, Israel, and Amnon, which is capital is Rabbah that he's talking about here. So Nebuchadnezzar is moving out of Babylonia and he is going to attack these three. The uh, more difficult con conquest is going to be Tyre uh, because of the way they're uh, fortified. So he is going to either come to Jerusalem first or to Ammon first, Rabbah. And that's the decision. Into his right hand comes the divination for Jerusalem in verse 22. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to pull up his army uh, north of Israel, north of Tyre, in Damascus. He's going to pause there, and he's going to ask his gods, thinking that they are real gods, uh, for direction on who he should attack first. Um, God himself, our God, Yahweh, is going to work through uh, Nebuchadnezzar's idolatry and direct him to go to Jerusalem. And that's what verse 22 is talking about. He is going to be directed to go to Jerusalem by God. And then down in verse uh, 24, and uh, let's say 25, And you, O profane, wicked one, prince of Israel, whose day has come, the time of your final judgment, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown, Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and bring low that is which is exalted. This is talking about Zedekiah. He is the wicked one. He is going to remove his turban, take off his crown that is going to be deposed. There's going to be a reversal in the land. All the powerful uh, ones are going to be killed. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 25 
tells us about that. Uh, the lowly are going to be left to tend the land, so they'll be raised up. And it says in verse 27, three times, ruin, 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 I will make it. And then verse uh, 27 goes on, how long will that ruin last? Until the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. Make a note, this is a reference to uh, Genesis 49.10. This is a uh, reference to uh, what is uh, translated there as Shiloh, the coming one, or the one to whom it belongs. This is saying that the kingdom, the Davidic uh, reign, is going to be temporarily paused from Zedekiah until Jesus comes. Until Jesus enters, and we'll see in the book of Matthew, until Jesus enters Jerusalem, as uh, Zechariah predicts he will on the foal of the donkey, and Jesus is ultimately rejected himself. So from Zedekiah to the... Uh, return of Jesus uh, the, in, X, or in Revelation chapter 19, we are living in this time called the times of the Gentiles. Uh, Luke 22, I think, uses that term, the times of the Gentiles. And uh, this is the period of time where there is no Davidic king on David's throne. He's awaiting the arrival of the one to whom judgment belongs, which is Jesus. And then finally, um, in verse 28, that sword that first came upon Jerusalem is now reject, uh, directed toward Amnon. For the last few minutes here, I'll just point out in chapter 22 then, this is a chapter of the furnace of judgment. And you can divide this up into uh, this first section uh, up to chapter 13, or verse 13, or let's say verse 16, which I would call the cause for judgment. And it's really a litany of sins that have been committed by Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, just uh, point out a couple things here. In verse 9, uh, it says, You who uh, eat on the mountains, commit lewdness in your midst. What's he talking about there? Can't you have a picnic on a mountaintop? We do that around here. Well, what he's talking about is the mountains and hills were places of idol worship. Uh, that uh, idols were uh, set up there, or shrines to idols were set up there. They were to have communal meals uh, to celebrate that God, and it would be nothing more than idolatry. God is judging them for that. That's what he's talking about. The lewdness is uh, sexual practices that were associated with those gods. They would be done in the open so the gods could see on top of the mountaintops. Very, uh, very crude uh, sorts of uh, worship there. Verse 11, one commits abomination with his neighbor's wife, another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law, another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. Sexual sin, sexual immorality is rampant. And again, it uh, seems like it's almost celebrated. It's out in the open just as they're worshiping other gods. Uh, so they are defiling their wives, their sisters, and um, again, in the Bible, I think uh, sexual sin is in a uh, separate category, and it's the uh, sign of the fullness of sin that's going to ultimately bring judgment. We see that over and over again in the Bible. Chapter, verse 17 uh, discusses the means of judgment down to verse 22. And then um, verse 23 uh, and uh, through the rest of the chapter, it's really talking about the um, recipients of the judgment. If you go through there, just note uh, how they're listed. Uh, verse 25 is the prophets. Verse, verse 26, the priests. Verse 27, the princes. Verse 28, the prophets again. So we see a, uh, the prophets at the beginning of the and the end kind of bookmarking the leadership. And then finally, in verse 29, the people, the people are going to receive this judgment. So that's our reading for today. I think it's uh, important for us as we are going through this process of sanctification to note how God brings judgment and how he graciously gives us first reproof. Uh, but uh, in his love for us as his children, he will continue to uh, Discipline us more and more severely until we heed it. So my prayer for myself and for you, brothers and sisters, is that we heed God's reproof and not suffer his scourging.
God bless you.